it just takes a moment. Um, bear with me to do. Okay. All right. Um, great. So we should be good to go. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual even, evening lecture series at the New York Studio School. Tonight, we're very, very pleased to be presenting Jelaine Jones on the work. Um, uh, thank you all for joining uh, and taking the time out on this Tuesday, beautiful Tuesday evening in New York City. Um, and Jelaine, thank you for, for being here to present your work. Um, before we begin, I would like to quickly recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported in part by public funds from the New York Department New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and many individual contributors. Uh, please do consider making a donation during or after tonight's talk by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.nyss.org. And then you just click the donate button. And um, we are very, very grateful for any contribution. Um, our programming would not be possible without uh, your very valuable support. Um, so thank you. Um, I will introdu introduce Jelaine in just one moment. Um, I also wanna call your attention to the bottom of the screen. You'll see a chat button and the Q and A button. Uh, feel free to, to click on those during the talk um, at any time and put in a, a chat or a comment. And we'll leave um, some time at the end to do Q and A and we can go back to images or uh, sculptures or um, at that time. Um, okay. So tonight is very special because uh, Jelaine is a valued faculty member at the New York Studio School. Um, just wanna put that out of the way. And uh, Jelaine Jones has been making sculpture since 1980 and teaching sculpture at the New York Studio School since 2002. Her practice and her goal as a teacher has sought to straddle categories, um, perspectives and disciplines for art making in a conviction that for the artist, it is all a fertile and level playing field. Uh, exhibitions include the New York Studio School, Salander O'Reilly Galleries, Paul Mellon Art Center, and the 2016 Decadorva Biennial. Uh, grants and residency fellowships between 2014 and 2019 include Pollock Krasner Foundation, McDowell Colony, Edward Albee Foundation, and Yaddo. Um, without further ado, please join me in a virtual welcome for Jelaine Jones. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, and thanks so much to the Studio School um, for inviting me to share my work. And, and thank you all for watching here. Um, I'm gonna show examples of my sculpture from phases over the last 40 years um, since, that, since 1980. Um, some of the images are, are, are fine and so, some are rough taken by myself and, and some are of work in progress in the studio. Um, I think what, what I'll do while I'm um, just before I start really is to share the screen with you for this PowerPoint and get this accomplished. Um, okay, just, just as a backdrop, um, um, my first studio, but work, first independent work after, after school. Um, what I thought I would do is, um, let me tell you what I'm going to be covering or the, 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 the first, the first section, the first decade of what I'm going to be talking about will really be about how, um, my, my art schooling and, um, the context from which I emerged. Um, and that's in, in a way a little bit thicker than when I, um, we'll, we'll um, start kind of rolling with with um, images of work which um, was more independent of those influences 
starting probably around the um, um, probably around 2000 or in, in the mid 90s. Um, so I first went to the College of Ceramics in Alfred, New York. That was in 1978. I had been making clay sculpture and this was what I wanted to keep doing. I was aware that this school was part of the recent merging of craft and sculpture. I had stayed for a year, um, only a year, but this was important. Craft is about building with materials, and specifically for me, building with clay instead of modeling over an armature, that sculpture can be realized directly through and about the process of building has been at the core of my work. Actually, they didn't let me touch clay in that foundation year, but I did a lot of research and experiments, and the activity going on there entirely supported my original plan going forward. I then went to the museum school in, in Boston, partly because I wanted access to the museum. I was used to this as a learning context and for ID, idea reference. My first body of work was in clay and based on a combination of Chinese limestone shrines at the museum, um, Motherwell Open Series, which I've been thinking about, and Donald Judd's wood boxes. But I also wanted it to torque and show the movement of the material. It, in Alfred, I had m m moved through different um, interests, but one particularly was was in minimalism, and, and the two major figures for me, and that was was Donald Judd and Agnes Martin. Um, but in the faculty at the school, the museum school, and exhibiting at the museum at that time. This was from 1979 to 83. There was a strong representation of post abstract expression sculpture and painting. Um, then, and because of that, I became aware of the sculpture of David Smith. And I felt that he was, his sculpture was a very serious challenge to understand. So I became quite, um, you know, a, a, a student of, of David Smith for quite a while. Um, I do want to say, and I'm, I'm kind of slowing down here with 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 these words and ideas, this uh, this opportunity to speak of speak of influence, um, especially because of the time that I came out of then, um, the late seventies. From my view now. Um, um, it, it is certainly um, um, a different view uh, and, and an understanding that I have now, as you know, so much so much time later. But in terms of the newer sculpture that I was absorbing, so particularly um, you had Donald Judd, who was a sculptor, who was a minimalist sculptor, and you had Dave Smith, another American sculptor, who was uh, more of an abstract sculptor, who was who, who, who dealt with a lot of scale changes in the work. Um, at the time, there was this polarity exaggerated between those two, those two sculptors. Uh, one was considered, David Smith was considered the formalist and Donald Judd the minimalist. Um, and, and, and it was as if one had to, um, pick a side. But um, I really felt as a student that, um, and, and continue to feel that, that it is instead a, a, a good mix and just a comparison, two ways to use. Um, they both present a sculptural idea, very clear, but different about inside and outside in a sculpture, but even more important, contrasting positions, equally valid on scale change within one work, uh, either for or against it, and how that engages the spectator. And I guess another way of saying that is that um, it was either um, uh, um, there was a criticism of David Smith being so composed that it closed up the work, um, and and that being a, a critique of the formalists, and then there was the critique of the minimalists where it was um, too open and not composed, and too theatrical. And, and I think instead that actually both um, have a valid um, place in, in the studio for a sculptor in terms of 
of thinking about how to proceed. Um, yeah, while I was involved with those influences, I was also looking at sculpture of the past. I was passionate about Romanesque and Gothic figures and beasts and Egyptian sculpture and sarcophagi and Chinese shrines. <clears throat> These, these few pictures coming ahead are of my uh, last year of school, school work where I had, at, I, at that point was working both in steel and clay, uh, more so at this point in steel in my last year. And so I'm, I, I don't have, you know, many more student works, but, but, but that clay one. Um, and then this, then a, a, a small group of steel works. Um, so more generally, um, there was the influence for me of the, of the British sculptor, Anthony Caro. Uh, he was exhibiting at the museum and visiting the school from abroad. His approach of welding together steel elements was infectious and for a while it dismantled my attachment to building. I began at school to work in steel as much as clay. And then coincidentally, a visiting sculptor did a course at the museum school on what was going on at St. Martin's School in London just then in a reaction against this approach of Caro's, tending towards collage um, and tending towards pictorialism during his previous time leading there. So this project there, I'll call it the body movement project, involved the manipulation of materials, paper, clay, steel, worked in regard to the study of movement forces, either directly through analysis of the dancer um, or of earlier sculpture or earlier figure sculpture. My work at school changed, especially in clay, with as these ideas I was hearing about were very important to me. Um, I, I felt um, I had a great appreciation for, for the, the kind of weight and behavior, and the physical behavior of clay and, and was, um, you know, using steel, but suspicious of, of, um, of collage to some extent with it. Um, I went to London in 1981 and I visited Caro in a studio, but also the Stockwell Depot studio, as they were called, where a group of these, these sculptors were carrying this project forward, working together, forging steel. They were in a sense recreating when I, when I came upon them, these Greek lions that were at the British Museum. I'll never forget it. Um, I had this strange feeling that these, these things were so inevitable. Um, though I wasn't sure they were art. Um, so thanks to Caro's, Anthony Caro's interest and a community connected to him, mostly in London, I found a context, though it was long distance. Um, it was something of an empire, so it was probably good to be separated from it. But it did provide me with dialogue and productive argument for years. And, and now I'm very grateful for it. Just as I finished um, school in 1983, Caro invited me to participate in a workshop in New York State. Um, and it turns out Tim Scott, who is a leader of this body movement project at St. Martin's, was also invited. Um, we began a dialogue at that point, and just afterwards, I assisted him forging a group of his sculptures at Utica, at Sculpture Space in Utica, New York. Um, and at that point, um, you know, after that, that was, um, you know, after school then. I was out of school, and I turned away from steel for, um, for, for a few years, for several years. I worked only in clay. Um, the clay work, um, as you can see, involved um, lots of volumetric forms, and 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 some were were more transparent, and some were more kind of bounded together. Some had a more of a kind of animal presence, and some were more abstract. But they all kind of meant to have a kind of, um, kind of mechanical bodily, 
um, sense of motion, um, both through the volumes inside and the, and the walls that were pulling them this way and that. So just to, you know, I, I, I had a complicated relationship with the formalist group as a critical mass. Um, this was, was, a, you know, a big, quite incredible community that, that, um, that Anthony Caro um, and, and, and mostly a lot of uh, sculptors and painters working out of London and some in America, um, including the dissenters um, I, had, I had a complicated relationship with and of this, you know, the dissenters in this body movement reaction. It started me off, it taught me to look at work very analytically, but it was too insular. And there were constraints which were awkward for my interests. I wanted to question and push the purity of it uh, to use sources that were perceptual or use narrative directly. I remember feeling um, at that first uh, workshop in 1983 that the heroism of David Smith wasn't allowed anymore in this context, that we should all take our places in the silent art production. But on the other hand, I was around, strangely, a British appreciation for the American abstract ethos. But I couldn't share that reverence or objectivity entirely for many reasons, including being partly American and going to school here and, and, and being of a younger age. But I saw also a savvy that was enabled by their interaction in London, which I was envious of. My adventures were full of naivete and failure, sometimes failure due to not embracing my adventure enough, uh, becoming polite in the work out of worry or lack of feedback, lack of stimulus and competition around me. It is good now to look back at this work um, with more appreciation, including appreciation for when it got particularly bizarre. My clay sculptures were autonomous. Uh, but I'll interrupt that and just say that, 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 um, I was invited by Caro in 1989 to participate in a workshop in Barcelona. And, and this was just, just incredible experience and a really good moment for me to be around other artists. Um, Though I was still working on these clay kind of bodies, I was frustrated with their literal and visual boundaries. You might see I was stretching them out more. Um, Caro, Caro's work there was particularly spatial. This was a good influence on the back of my mind, using iron, iron work he found. And Susanna Solana was in the workshop and also had a show up at these incredible cage-like sculptures in Barcelona. Um, my clay sculptures were autonomous, um, and I shared that conservative stance with this body movement um, group. Uh, and that I could see that we were sharing this was helpful uh, in wondering about it. And, and really, I found it ironic um, because the project regressed from some of the best things about the sculpture it was reacting against. Anthony Caro's work of the 60s, which interacts through a lot of space while maintaining an implicit physicality. Uh, such an incredible thing, um, what happens with that work of the 60s. So this problem was in the back of my mind. Um, this problem of, of this, you know, conservative, um, uh, autonomous quality, non, kind of non-interactive quality with the viewer. Uh, which, which I was frustrated by. So, um, at that point, I, I was trying to figure out how to, um, you know, bring the outside space into, into the work. And, um, 
you know, there was a, the, the, a kind of strange mechanical quality to, to, to some of it, almost, almost like a huge lumbering object against the ground. And again, quite mechanical in, in the way that the steel and the clay work together. But I was trying to separate out, um, you know, and make it very clear where clay was holding volume and the weight of the clay and then the weight of a, a, a very distinct um, mass. Um, and so I was working very hard on that. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how successful it was with, with this one, but it was, um, uh, an interesting process to, uh, scale up this, this small model and, um, and make this very large fired clay and steel sculpture. I was again interested in exposing uh, and shifting that the nature of that clay wall, um, so that it that it kind of breathes more, was was more alive than than I felt I was uh, working it in those earlier um, kind of more consistently volumetric sculptures earlier. Um, for, for a few years, I, I returned to the clay work, um, that, that was, um, you know, late eighties. And I used some of those forms as prototypes in steel on a larger scale because I felt as if the, um, I, I could kind of open it up and loosen it, loosen it up with the steel and, um, you know, pushing these plates together and welding up the steel um, to give it a clay-like and malleable quality, but also have it kind of um, straddle with the, um, the uh, hard hardness of the steel with, with this sense of malleability. So um, this is one of, of two sculptures that, that I think mark a turning point. Um, I was really just oversaturated with the, the gestural and, and the dogma of the gestural and this, this long phase um, that I had that had started, you know, in 1981 or so. Um, and I, and I saw this great, um, Gothic, Spanish Gothic effigy at the V&A in London. Um, it's still displayed there. Um, a, 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 you know, a life-size carved stone effigy. And I, I, I love the idea of this kind of very, very silent and, and nearly still, um, gesture against the ground. Um, so and and then with these steel uh tubes which had channel that you you might pass through and so again it, it was like kind of silencing and stopping the movement and i was i was so excited to do that um and had it be of an accumulation of parts have the form be made out of an accumulation of parts versus a very um a a, a, a very formed and intentional um um, work, um, but but the 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 other really important thing about the sculpture, which comes up which comes up again and again for me, and something I'm even working on presently, is is the horizontality of it and and the simple horizontality of it, and how that it has a very a much more direct uh, relationship with the spectator. Um, you know, we're generally, you know, vertical when we stand up and look at something and there it is horizontal. And there's not a lot of um, um, kind of um, what kind of barrier between it and you feeling that. So it's, it, I felt it was much more exposed and confrontational as, as a form, much more immediate as a form. So I was quite excited about that. Um, <laughs> Then I had uh, a quite a strange um, phase where I was 
actually combining image and the idea of um, a wall of a wall of clay with a very needed um, modeled area that that um, kind of signified and expressed uh, um, a, a kind of an emotional um, feeling, a, a sort of pathos. Um, and so these were there. These were a, 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 a group that where I was really moving into thinking about image uh, with the work for the first time, as combined with this focus on on the behavior and quality of the material itself, and, and trying to keep that breathing, but also have the, the image there as well. So th this this sculpture was was kind of the other one that I think of as as this kind of big turning point for for me, and um, it did carry some of that emotional narrative forward. But um, in terms of how it was built and considered, um, uh, first uh, logistically, technically, it, it actually took those clay walls. And it used the clay walls, but it I filled the clay walls with plat with, with with red wax, and uh, then when the red wax cooled, pulled pulled off the um, pulled off the clay. But I had cables running through it, and and I was very interested in in moving through a, a real space, and and um, having it function almost as a space. Um, and this one, it, as soon as as soon as I can hit the ground in this way, which is more open, I immediately set it up in in, in a quite traditional way in terms of dealing with um, you know um, uh, perception and perspectival issues, which is that I had kind of three zones: uh, one one being kind of foreground. Um, being more interactive with you, the spectator, the middle area being more um, middle ground, but also representing um, an area which was more traditional to a statuary, uh, more comparable to the human body, but just um, separate. And then a third area, which is more kind of like a uh, you know, background, more at a distance at a, at a small scale, where, where in this in this one I had a, a kind of a landscape with the trees and steel and concrete. So at at this point, um, just before the turn of the century, I I, I started um, working. Um, Perceptually, with with models, um, I I was interested. I was very aware of this idea of the of, of the field now versus the the, the isolated object, and um, and also very interested in in um, um, you know pushing pushing my sculpture further um, with perceptual information. Um, so what I did is I had uh, models, um, I set up structures and I had models, one model, uh, I think I probably was working with a, a couple of different models at that point. Um, so I would have always not just the model, but the model and the structure. Um, and I was working in phases and I was working in many different materials because I wanted to see how the different materials behaved and, 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 and gave me ideas and translated the, the, the presence of, of, of this situation. Um, and so, and, and so I, and I would have a model there and then I would make a, a study and then I would make from the study kind of a mock-up out of different materials, mixed media materials. And, and it was very interesting because there was a kind of a blur and an exchange between the mock-ups of mixed materials and then the sculpture. 
Um, and Nick, this sculpture actually was just one figure at one side, and then it was the model, a model standing in two different positions, which kind of got morphed into two figures in one place. Um, and then this was pretty much a, a direct, um, an iteration of that, um, mixed sculpture. And I, I did certainly consider this a sculpture, but I, I have to say that it got kind of cannibalized and turned into other sculptures. Um, so then with space, there is this perspectival information, right? So you have, again, you've got the, you've got the, foreground and the middle ground and the, and the background and this one I was um, it was this was kind of my, my first experiment with it where I actually had a setup in my studio with the gantry and that that other sculpture with the wax and I I made the sculpture based on one fixed point of view of it and I was very interested to to um, to use the um, the you know, kind of our interior and physical optical experience of something moving up, of course, um, towards our, our eye level, but moving up, you know, in the distance. And actually, you know, um, um, kind of making the structure out of that perspective of distortion, that that becomes the, the, stru the structure of the work and the narrative of, of the work, but the, the form of the work. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I've continued to, to, to think about this, you see, in, in all, in, in so many sculptures going forward, but, um, the perspectival, um, uh, relationship or use of the perspectival, but, um, I now, I now, I mean, I continue to use it either explicitly or implicitly, and now it has it going forward, it took on a more psychological, reason as well. I did the uh, a number of 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 these single figurative works. Um, and what was what was exciting um for me, I mean part of my my um way of working and thinking about them was that even though they they are ostensibly um monolithic what was dynamic for me was that they don't really function sculpturally as a monolith that they feel more like a field um i mean that the forms converge and unify as a grouping but maintain a kind of solidarity with the outside um uh, with the space shared with the viewer Um, this is uh, a, the, the, probably the largest um, work of this group. You, you can see it in this rather distracting, I'm afraid, um, view of where I made it in the studio where I made it. Um, and this this was also set up in in three zones um, using. Um, you know, quite, quite literally thinking about it in embodying space with, with these chunks, with, um, space forms. And then also having the, the, um, this, this, this kind of unifying steel, um, moving, moving through the group. And, um, so the, there's, there's one area, uh, which is, which, which feels closest to the viewer really, um, where, where you have a, a kind of weight, a small weight hanging. Um, and then you have a central area, um, which, which again is, 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 um, it, it it's less about, uh, you know, close middle ground and foreground. It's more in this case, more about the central kind of, statuary place where where you have a um a set of a form relationships in the in the in the middle which which thrust out rather than falling down and kind of have an internal um um 
kind of mechanic to it, mechanics. And then, and then the last area, it's, um, more, uh, totemic, more monumental, more, more inert in a sense. So I was very interested in setting up these, these three very different qualities, um, together in this work. And then, and then of course, having it be quite raw and, uh, close to, to the viewer, uh, it's ex quite accessible. Um, so, so I, I then went, went back to working s directly with processes and thinking about gesture, um, again. And, um, so here, here you have clay and it's, and it's more unified, um, traditionally because of the way it connects as, as material, but, um, they were, they were set up to be kind of in opposition to any sense of a, of having a core or overall form closure. I didn't want any form closure with them. I wanted, wanted them to, 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 to kind of be, um, very participatory in the outside space and, and, and have these two quite, quite different, um, um, kind of dual modes of, of behaving, um, to be co kind of coexisting together. Um, just to say that it, it has always been important to me to, to turn around and around and to remember and to take back up earlier commitments, um, to set aside approaches which begin to do, to outweigh and discount um, earlier appreciations, and then to bring them back again. You know, this this is another of this group where I was really thinking about kind of compressing into the center, but but very much from the outside. Um, so, you, so you didn't feel that there was a core, but that was there was a unity that was actually a, a kind of collision from the outside. Um, then, at this point, I I returned to the idea of working, working. Well, I combined the idea of working perceptually, but with the movement idea. I'm thinking about uh, um, um, movement forces. And so I had this, uh, I had this narrative set up in, in a sense. I set up this specific structure in the studio to have the model move through. And this structure you'll see happens kind of again and again. It's, it's, it's a, it's a movement that's sort of framed in a cubic space. And then there's that outlet, you know, and it comes outside. It turns, it turns out. Um, and this was a kind of narrative about body consciousness, it's about an effort getting from ground level to stand up and to move forward. And what I saw, what I saw the model doing was what was the track of this movement. Um, I felt an empathy with her effort, um, her internal need to concentrate on this. Um, but once she was standing, um, at that taller place with, with the structure. Once she succeeded in standing, she could, she could stop thinking. She could stop working, stop concentrating on it, on her internal self. It's kind of externalized, become part of this structure. And then she kind of unifies with the structure. And then she comes out and it's, it's kind of like she and the structure comes out, but it's much lighter, more feminine. So, so I was kind of parsing out the idea of the, of the weightier, heavier movement, um, using, using the darker tone and then the out, outside of that, um, um, with the lighter tone of wood. And, and, um, again, as before, I, trying with the different materials to elicit different ideas about what I was seeing happening. This actually was a different um, movement. It was a, a much more simple movement um, up and against the vertical form. But but this bar relief um, 
um, it is refers to um, that kind of enclosed space and then opening around and, and becoming more a part of the environment. Um, this work um, was uh, probably, you know, the largest iteration directly related to that. Um, to that narrative, that way of moving um, kind of around the corner, out and downwards into into um, spit into a kind of a real place of being contained and then opening up and coming down. But you can see on the on the right, this is how I I make work out of uh, concrete and and steel or plaster and steel. That most usually work in clay so I can work in clay incrementally and then I decide once I've got that figured out uh, what I'm going to transfer that's those steel forms into what materials so so for instance in this one the the kind of entryway which is this long kind of volumetric diagonal is is more of a um what it's um it's it's kind of more of a neutral mass, right? And then um, and then as you come into the center, there there's a weight and kind of a a, a crashing together in the center, and that was uh, cast into concrete. Um, and then it comes down. There's a concrete block, and then there's there's a big steel form that comes down. Is that one? So um, the, these are these are two iterations kind of of this of this sort of movement, um, parsing out um, these mass forms that kind of resolve themselves through it. Um, so you have this a continual movement that coalesces into a form quality you know, inside the framework. So this one is an extension of that project, but more about my own experience, uh, about my own experience um, on a walk. Um, it is a kind of diagram of levels according to my body and, and views on a walk. Um, it's again in, in three zones. So you have the more floating end, um, which is a form, there's a form viewed at a distance at head height, and that replaces kind of my head form with a view form. And then under that is, is kind of a pathway of, or where my, my hips are kind of delineated. And then under that is kind of this floating, um, markers for, um, for, for ground level, you know, ground level, a slight distance to me, upwards of me, upwards of that step coming down right at, at the corner there. And so then this central kind of form, which is the heaviest area has to do with, um, my kind of, as, as I'm, as I'm, you know, walking through the woods, I'm, I'm concentrating on the ground around me and the rocks around me. And, and so I cast and kind of pulled in that information into the, into the weight of, of that form idea. And then, and then the whole kind of, the whole structure kind of then coalesces and, and, and becomes a, the, the framework for this journey, the short journey, then, then becomes Kind of animated by getting connected to the strange, you know, um, kind of heavy weight that, that comes down on, onto the ground. Um, yeah. So these, these sculptures, um, extend this, this series. They, they, um, I haven't talked so much about levels up, up and down, um, the, the vertical level. 
but but these these three fairly large works um, really exaggerate this this stretch and diminishment uh, through space and and um, you know pulling across the ground and then getting higher and higher into into something which is which is more optical to something which is more um, kind of rounded to something which is more optical. Um, but but I'm also really interested in the idea of um, this kind of psychological um, relationship we have through an area which is more below below him, below uh, kind of a subterranean level, which is more um, confrontational and unconscious and subterranean in a way, more physical. We don't think about it so much. It's kind of just is, is, is there kind of hiding away, but very, very present and, and, and very much of our kind of underpinnings. And then, and then the difference between that and then having a form at, in, in the distance, which is, which is more at head height again and more kind of optical, but, but also refers to, um, something much more conscious and, and perhaps more to do with melancholia or, or longing or, or nostalgia, sentiment. Uh, this, this was one of a group of tabletop pieces. Um, tabletop sculptures can be so annoying, um, because they, they, they can automatically become very autonomous. Uh, or, 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 or bodily, or like a model of something. Um, so I, I was, I was, you know, partly interested in trying to disrupt those cliches. Um, I wanted to also work with these, these, these more or less simple forms, which are constructed out of clay, which were unquestionably handheld sorts of forms, um, handmade in scale and presence. They weren't forms you would associate with anything but themselves and had a ponderous kind of object weight to them. And I wanted to merge these with and have them make sense with um, a linear, a linear um, a kind of order that, that had to do um, with, with a kind of vast of space, kind of referred to almost the landscape space. So I was very interested in pushing those two realities together and making it a, a, out of it an object but but having it um hold uh quite a lot of space but then have these clunky things in, in it um i was also interested in in spreading out um across a pedestal so that as you come up to it from different viewpoints, it drastically changes and there's a kind of torquing that goes on as and movement of it with you as you as you as you as you walk around it. And um something that that you know I was thinking about was was interesting is that I, I there's a there's a critique of of um of minimalist work of, of, you know, through its the kind of object, the objecthood of, of things and being rather theatrical. And I, and I rather liked, um, um, kind of teasing that idea with having these very, um, kind of th these things that I have had a lot of objecthood, um, to them and, and almost a foray into a kind of openness, uh, that, that I very much, um, value in, in minimal start. So in, in 2012, I got a Paul Krasner grant, thank goodness. And so I, I bought a load of steel and I did a Europe trip. Um, I was not feeling challenged at that moment by this love fest I was having with space. And I wanted to turn around, turn back and remember some other issues. Um, I went to studios and exhibitions in London and I, and I found my reaction was wanting to compress into some lessons, um, of statuary. In Paris, I focused on versions of the Greek crouching Venus, but I was also super taken with this 1910, um, 
um, Joseph Bernard, this very centrifugal um, figure, quite decorative figure of, of a picture girl, a young girl swinging, quite linear sculpture of a girl swinging, a heavy picture. Um, and anyway, I, I committed to kind of making transcriptions of these two sculptures in my studio for at least the next year. Um, there were these um, opposing pressures I inside them and, um, and, and, and wonderful ways they were hitting, hitting the ground differently with their, with their weight. And there was, there was just so much information that I was learning from. And I, and I shaved these really in the form of process and process dates because I think that, that that is so much of what I got out of it. It was a kind of a laboratory time in the studio where I was kind of regrouping with, 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 with kind of these essential sculptural ideas that I wanted to kind of touch. Um, and, 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 um, kind of reestablish if I, if I, you know, or, 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 um, or establish, you know, to have that, um, you know, participate in the work going forward. And so you, you can see kind of typical ways in which I work still in the studio here, clamping clay and steel together, et cetera, et cetera, whatever I need to do. Um, this is um, this is kind of transition from from those uh, transcriptions to um, to both um, the, the clunky ceramic forms with these with these mass shapes that kind of spreading out uh, into space um, and there's a lot of um, you know kind of both just kind of everything like materiality and space and um, although this actually still does have to do with the picture girl somewhat. Uh, okay, so I, I did a, I did a residency in New Hampshire in 2014. And, um, that was just, just a wonderful three months of focusing. Um, I, my plan had been, my proposal was to work perceptually from an area in the woods. And so I did this, I, I did do this, I followed through. And I, yet I, f I realized that, that I found surprisingly this, this horizontal body that I had not expected, um, which, it, which appeared within it. Um, I was going back and forth from the studio to a location in the woods and my views included a whole lot of depth. So much depth that this, this huge horizontal form was exactly at my hip height perspectively. And, and, um, because of that, it, it, it became a body and, and not just a log. Um, there was all this space between us, between myself and this. This, this figurative form, this, this log, and that, that was interesting. The this, this space was protecting it from me. Um, and then it was also interesting that when I set up this, this, this sculptural structure based on these, these zones moving through and levels, you know, zones you know, forward and, and back in depth and then zones up, up and down, um, which were really quite exacting in terms of what I was experiencing. Um, at my body levels. Um, and I, and I just found that so interesting, this, this kind of body empathy that you would, you, you would have for these forms in front of you. Um, and, and it was also interesting that when I came back, or, or, you know, once I'd made the sculpture, when I, I could come around the back of it in a sense and get right on top of this body form. I mean, there was no, there was no protection at all for it. And, and that, that was interesting. So it kind of became more of an object, um, than, than a kind of an image, um, from different views. Um, and, and I also realized that this, this horizontal body form very much referred to that steel effigy that, that I spoke of, that horizontal steel sculpture. Um, and another idea for me around this time was to start to resist obvious creative mediation of, of, of nature. 
Um, this is obviously impossible as, I, as I'm completely in manipulating an extremely selective um, kind of interpretation of what I'm seeing, but somehow to set up an emulation of randomness or a silent order in seeming, ram seeming randomness or even an importance, importance to a, a clarified chaos in nature. This is the, the next work following that in my industrial studio um, and, and kind of ideas in, in, in progress. And, and in, in, in this one, I was thinking about movement and walking through a forest and um, about how our body engages kind of with chunks of ground and fallen cylinders, logs, they're kind of dependent on as like psychological anchors as we're moving through it. They're fixed on economically. Um, there isn't enough time to seize too much. Um, but the sensation that I wanted to make dominant is, is a kind of a moving through and a flux and a, a path that kind of materializes with this, with these kind of centrifugal uh, verticals. Uh, this is a, 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 something that, th this is the beginning of, of the next idea of, of a large sculpture, uh, you, you can see, and this was also a continuation of, of that New Hampshire sculpture. Um, and this is, this is pretty much what it became. It has, has, it had made some changes, um, in developments after this, but pretty much this is what it is, and um, this this is different. You know, I'm I'm kind of switching around in my in my role uh, in relation to nature, and and in this one, um, kind of exaggerating the the architectural and also the anthropomorphic um, possibilities in this scene that that I'm looking thinking about. Um, but then, you know, and that's, that's a great deal of, of, um, what, uh, mediation of distortion, human distortion on, on a, a, a view of a place, an experience with a natural place. And then, um, and then to, in, in a sense, let the, let the sculpture kind of repossess it, let, let the work repossess this this interpretation and, and, and it kind of became a place that, uh, of its own kind of silence, its own kind of noise that wasn't particularly, um, um, it wasn't a work, it, it was highly manipulated, but then it wasn't actually, it was more autonomous, interestingly, in, interestingly enough, there was a silence and a kind of sense of self-possession that it, that it, um, acquired. Um, yeah. This is actually a small, uh, well, not too small, but it's a, it's a table piece that, that is a, uh, is based on looking at that sculpture. And it's, uh, it's kind of about parsing out the areas of, of, of compression and the areas of, um, a, a volume and structure and a kind of a, a tensile structure area, but it's also um, held volume in it, as opposed to the, the weighty mass areas. So it was um, a, a kind of a, a perceptual and analysis in the sense of the sculpture. Um, this one is has, has a kind of opposite um, motivation to the last one. Um, I'll tell you what the title is because it helps explain it. It's called uh, Exit Susanna. And it is an effort to be of a place that is not being gazed at. I made this clay part 
which needed a place. It was a clay part, you see in the, in the front kind of here. It's, it was, it had this kind of private charm, this kind of magical quality, this thing. Um, so the sculpture was kind of making a place for this. So the idea of, a, of an interstitial zone, uh, as per us humans, could be a place, a scene, which we, which we come on too quickly to affect it. Um, and for me especially, to affect it would be to analyze, to make form out of its space. Um, this were cold space only in its well, private places, in its twos. Um, but otherwise, it is physically abrupt of its materiality, and it's a kind of a collision of its elements. It means to squeeze out and, and not allow the romancing of, of space by the maker or the spectator. Um, this continues the work um, about a confrontation with with the place and a, a kind of unmediated place, um, but more close. Um, here I'm I'm kind of getting inside the the very raw natural behavior of materials, clay, concrete, iron, and kind of turning them inside out. Um, you know, by their comparison, um, looking for a transparency through their comparison and looking for the essence of each. Um, the ground kind of is magnetic and how the, how the form pulls off of it, um, how it hovers over it, how it falls back onto it. Um, almost like the ground is, is the core that, that we share with it. Um, so sharing this gravitational sensation, um, yeah, that's, that's, this is quite a new work, um, not brand new, but it's of uh, last a year ago. And, um, these two, with these two, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how, how different form types can coexist together and kind of make, make a, um, make a structure, a very unusual structure, um, and kind of an impossible structure, but a structure that is unified and works. You know, I, I feel they work. But, but I'm also very interested in, in the fact that, that each each kind of form type um, is almost competing with the other. It's kind of a collision again. Um, that there isn't this, this gradation of scale through it. Um, there is some, but there is more so a collision of a very different thing. And um, I, I, I like the immediacy of, of, of that idea. Um, and and that it it um you know that they intentionally compete intentionally compete and they don't settle down intentionally don't settle down and and also that they're kind of human made forms um and yet strange and raw and the the uh, composite you know of these very different form types is absolutely um kind of unnatural, yeah. I have been doing a lot of clay coil uh, work and this one got more developed and some of them have, have directed me to be thinking about Again, that, that steel effigy. Um, and yet it, it, it opens it up and, um, uh, it, it, it's more spatial. It holds more space and there's different, you know, types of, of uh, weight, you know, with, within this. And, um, 
and I was I was thinking about I've been thinking about air, getting air or even methane through like a tube into the ground or out of the ground and thinking about kind of you know pulling in or breathing in oxygen for instance and then it kind of getting transformed you know into into different forms you know in different in, in different kinds of uh, material qualities and then traveling and then kind of exhaling out Um, these are, are, are fairly recent, this group. They, um, they, they again have to do with the idea of a, a collision of different types of forms. Um, they also, I haven't mentioned animism. Um, animism, of course, is the, um, is the potential soul or is the belief that an inanimate object can have a soul. Um, and that's certainly something that I've been interested in for a long time. And I think that um, these, um, you know, there's, there's a, I, I, I'm interested in, in an openness um, not closing something down too much, and, I'll, and I'll, again, a kind of collision of different form types, and a sense of, um, you know, of uh, kind of an est a strange solidarity with with the viewer, um, but but then again, a um, an incredible like physical um, presence or a, um, a presence which is almost of um anima um you know there's there's a, a a feeling that i almost want them to be a little bit incomplete um in order to um pull the viewer in but um kind of kind of teetering on that between um completed and open closed and open um yeah, so that's actually, um, that is all my images. And so, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll just stay here. And um, if anyone has any questions or. All right, I'll, I'll give a clap for everyone, Jelaine. Thank you very much. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, so if you if anyone does have questions, you can just go to the bottom of your screen, you can click on the Q and A and um and then put in a question. There's a few here I see already. Um it's really it's really interesting to see how your work sort of expands and contracts in, in this different way over over your whole time. Um that's my own personal um evaluation. I'm, I'm curious. Thank you. While people put in questions, I'm I'm curious. Do you see these as uh, you said that you're you're keeping these? Um, I'm not sure exactly what word you said, but almost like um, you want them to be approachable. Are they like? Do you see them as fragments? Almost, you know, like a, I'm almost thinking of like, you know, a, an arm from Rodin or something like that. Not romanticized, but like. No, I don't see them as fragments at all. Okay. No, no. Uh, but it's a good question. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. It. It's, it's an important question, I think, to ask. Um, but, but I think that um, uh, I really do feel I, and work hard on making them feel um, completed, um, whole. And um, but that wholeness really does come from, strangely, a, a, a set of disparate. Um, kind of a triad, maybe of disparate types. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I will. Um. Uh, this question is from Diana St Stoll. <clears throat> Jelaine, the structural supports you keep in the work sometimes act 
as a separate piece framing the more massive forms, it's quite unique to keep the structure in with the form. Uh, and she, they find it very provocative. Why keep the structural supports is perhaps to help the delineate the landscape type space. Them. Well, I, I think you're probably, hi Diane, I don't, I think you're probably not talking about these. Um, I'm not sure which ones, but I, I think that um, like, like even this one or, or, or some of these, these here, for instance, this is the, the, the linear is holding a, uh, again, it's, it's kind of a different kind of material, it's kind of a different ingredient that coexists with the mass. So I think I'm setting them up against each other. The difference is, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, I, um, I don't, you know, I don't, uh, uh, that part of, for me, what, what some of the linear work does is, is, um, moves out into a, a greater space. And I, I guess I, I really um, began to feel this great aversion towards monolithic sculpture. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that I ever really made monolithic sculpture because even my earlier play works are kind of constructions, you know, that are, but, but anyway. Um, well, CK says, incredible work, Jelaine. You often use steel linear elements and molded material, such as clay, plaster, or concrete, as masses and volumes. Do you see one as dependent on another? Uh, for example, steel, spatial, structural framing, while clay hangs, wraps, droops from the steel. How does this inform connections between materials? Has steel become more dependent on clay in recent work? So am I, am I um, switching the role of steel in recent work? Is it not having such an obvious um, position as a structural element? I mean, it, it should be, it, it should, it, I'm hoping that it takes on different roles, but I, I think maybe what you're bringing up, thank you, um, is um, what I haven't really mentioned, which is kind of the, the obvious, that I'm just really interested in parsing out the difference between the, between, you know, this, this great duality that we always, you know, feel in our environment or, or in structures or in bodies between, um, between what is compressed and what is expansive. There's always that duality. And so, um, working in steel and clay, um, I'm, I'm able to kind of use those two materials to, um, to clarify that. Okay. Um, here's a question from Emily, Emily Nam. She's asking, is there a consideration to the participant's experience um, while you are making, or are you working directly with response uh, to the current question you are using to drive the work? Um, in other words, do you have an intended experience for the observer? Yes, I definitely have an intended experience with the viewer. Yeah. Um, so that it's not really a separate thing. The, the ideas of, of interaction are, are kind of what are, are happening to me in the studio, but I'm very much thinking about um, my own interaction with it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm both a maker and, and, and a viewer at the same time. And so it's not a separate idea. The, the concepts of how it interacts and, it's, and, and, and how it exists in space and the kind of, 
structural idea um, and a possible physical force that they're all that they're all meant to be in unison. Um, there's a, a couple of questions sort of building off of that, I think. Um, this is from Elsa Hoffman. Um, she says, hi, Jelaine, many of your sculptures are directly related to a specific environment. When you are making your works, do you have a specific location for displaying the final work? And do you imagine they need to live in a specific environment to be seen accurately? No, no, I definitely don't. I mean, they separate out from their source and they became the, they become their own sculptures. But they, they, you know, as as you saw, some of them really do have these these contexts that they're that they were that they're they're motivated by um, very much. Um, but then they they certainly wouldn't want to go back into those contexts, most likely, and. Um, yeah, but but the whole question of the sensitivity of um, a work to a con context that it gets put into is a, is a whole another conversation. And, and and I guess what you you want to do is just is is make it uh, honor the thing and make it as readable as possible within within a a context situation. So. Um, that becomes a lot more complicated if it's outside because you've really got to make sure that outer space is not distracting. I, um, yeah, I, I find my very open work, it's more difficult outside. And it's, that, that's a whole, um, some of them, some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, but particularly the really linear ones are difficult outside because all of the, the busyness of the place comes begins to distract and, 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 and invade. I think that's a whole discipline in and of itself is how to, how to, um, and, and, uh, and the project, right? How to be with the, um, an outside environment as, as a sculpture. To me, that seems like a, a project that, um, um, it is almost, you know, site-specific now. Yeah, I think this question, Bill, continues this. Um, it's from Caitlin McDonough. She says, thank you for such a generous presentation, Jelaine. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly, particularly struck by your words describing your field figures and how they have a certain solidarity with the outside, with the space shared with the viewer. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps say, about it more about the ty types of forms which function in this way for you. The solidarity with the outside, the qualities that engender the solidar solidarity and expand it. Huh. I'm trying to get back to that. Those are, those are 2000, <sighs> these here, this one especially, yeah. Um, well, you know, at this time, especially, I was really trying to think about space as form. And, and they're, they're, um, they're assemblages, you know, and they're, there's a kind of a pressure of space, uh, of this, of this material outside, which the, the way it, um, uh, is not bounded in the sense the way it there's a flux to it and the way it moves on the on the outside of of kind of uh, in an unprotected um, sort of way with with the um, with this kind of an internal wood structure. I'm thinking, Caitlin, that it's to do with the the um, the kind of outsideness and the and the sense of it being assembled and not held, not contained. Do, I hope that might answer. Um, Audrey has a has a comment that might sort of 
uh, relate to that as well. She says, um, great talk. Um, the log sculpture um, has a sense of humor or animus. And she, she said that she was laughing when you moved to the far side of it and were able to stand and look down on it as opposed to the initial idea of being held at a distance. Um, it, she says, not sure what the question is, but it, it definitely made her laugh um, at that kind of like surprise with the form and, and interact like um, being held at a distance and then like the, the shock of it perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't feel that funny. I mean, it was kind of ominous, um, you know, it was kind of ominous and rather soulful rather than funny. But anyway, but thank you um, for that, for that comment, Audrey. Um, let's see. So, and there's a, a couple of questions here. Um, um, from another, from the Audrey Cohn and, uh, and, um, and Marie are asking about drawing in your process. Um, and Anne Marie says, uh, beautiful presentation of your work, Jelaine, thank you. Uh, your use of the steel feels very, very like drawn lines holding the clay and plaster masses. Um, and uh, what, what relevance or place, if any, does drawing have within your sculpture process? Um, well, I guess it, it, it probably has a lot. I draw, I draw every day. I start every day drawing perceptually. Um, that's, um, and then I, um, drawing is, is something that will part, part, become a, a kind of a studio, um, studio event. It has to, I have to have the right moment to be able to push out away the the um, the needs of the the sculptures are always demanding a lot of time from me, and so um, they they compete for time from from drawing. But I have drawn in different ways at at different at different moments, but they tend to be um, more isolated opportunities when it comes to making a series of, of works uh, that are two-dimensional that, that are more in um, in parallel to the ideas of the sculpture and um, and I guess when I mentioned in you know really uh, I I spent so much time drawing uh, on the landscape and the coast in the in north of Maine for, for years and years and years and years and still sometimes have the opportunity and it's um, um, the um, the experience of the intense experience of, 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 of perspectival um, phenomena on the ocean really did um, did inform that that idea of of extreme uh, differences and in interaction with something which is very far away and so 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 small and very very intimate and at, at a large scale so um, so that um, definitely affected um, ideas about about using perspectival information structurally. Yeah, and then I've done a lot of ink drawings where I'm I'm working the ink rather like rather like the steel. Um, yeah. Um, maybe a time for a couple more if that's if that's good. Um, um, Audrey Cohen Gans is also wondering how you think about color in your work. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't really think that much of, I would think about value. I think about the weight of value, um, a lot more than I think of color. I think about, I think about warm and, um, my, my involvement with color is, is limited. So I think it's probably not a question that we should, 
we should spend too much time on. But thank you for the question, Audrey. All right. Um, and uh, Elaine is, um, she's asking about, you, you're mentioning animism. Um, it seemed like those works that you were working on were coming out of um, that idea of animism. Um, do you think you, could you expand on that more? Just Yeah. More? Um, well, I, I, I am interested in, you know, so, so here you've got a work which is very um, controlled in its form making, very human made in what, right? And then, and then you've got, well, this too, very constructed by, by person. And yeah, okay, so the, I, and I, I don't, I don't know. I think that there's, there's certain kinds, there's, there's a, um, an interest and a respect for a kind of form that, that has a kind of presence. Um, that has a kind of noumenal presence, right? Versus phenomenal, not, not based on, on human, um, not based on human translation that it in, in itself feels as if it's breathing and existing, uh, even if you weren't there. Um, yeah. Sounds like something that really comes out of your experience with the landscape. I mean, to some degree. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that um, this this one, I mean, this this moves it, that that idea slightly in a different direction into the idea of kind of embodying landscape, where the landscape becomes terrain, becomes a body, um, which I think is what um, I was thinking about here. Um, trying to, to, um, to, to make kind of very transparent gesture of forces that, that, that were, were against gravity through materials, which, which kind, of, kind of gave this anima to, to, um, to um, kind of landform feelings. And, and and kinds of things that you would you you'd almost just come upon or find very very raw and don't look like they've been you know overly composed by somebody so un you know less mediated again. Interesting. Well, um, I think I'm coming to the end of my Q and A. There's um, you know Jeff. Uh, from Diana Stoll's account says that he really loves the 2020 piece and um, how the, he loves the strong negative shapes and the way the clay holds up the, the steel um, and several people are just saying thank you for, for such a generous talk which I'll reiterate this has been really interesting to see your this journey and, um, and here you discuss weight and space and form and your interaction with the materials. So, so thank you. No, oh, you're and, welcome. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. And um, and I uh, hope you tune in for the next coming weeks. <laughs>